to a visitor from another realm. Everything that we consider natural might very well be an affront to their existence. And who's to say that they're the ones in the wrong? Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creatures from past editions of Dungeons and Dragons and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition game. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we are talking about a creature that comes to us from 3rd edition. And no, I am not talking about 3.5, I am talking about 3.0, the much more broken cousin of 3.5. The Kaordi are the living hubris of a group of high elf wizards that dared to venture into the far realm. As the story goes, a group of high elf wizards were looking to expand their powers and they found a gateway into the far realm, which is the realm of existence that all the ancient evils live in, such as Cthulhu and Dagon and all those lovely fellows. The thing about the far realm is creatures who live there are insane and chaotic and they don't follow the same rules of existence that we do in the material plane. So the thing about creatures from the material plane going into the far realm is it was almost like a virus intruding upon a body. The entire plane itself and all of its denizens reacted immediately to this intrusion into their domain. As the story goes, one of the elder evils happened to be drifting by and its mere presence corrupted these high elf wizards beyond repair. It happened so quickly quickly that the elder evil who corrupted these elves didn't even realize that he had done it. He simply turned his attention towards this disturbance that was felt in the Far Realm, and by the time he was looking in their direction they had already been twisted into their chaotic forms. The result of this instantaneous corruption was the birth of the first Kaordi, a group of twisted humanoid creatures that were once elves longing for the material plane. What lore exists does tell us that the Kaordi don't retain any of their humanity or elf manity in this situation, they simply have this urge to return back to the material plane and they don't know why it's there. And unfortunately, when the Kaordi did manage to make their way back to the material plane, it wasn't what they had hoped for. This ancient and almost primal memory that had existed within each one of the Kaordi that was longing for the material plane had turned out to be nothing more than remnants of their past selves. In fact, the material plane itself acted as a toxin to the Kaordi who traveled there. The natural order of the prime material simply just went against every fiber of their being, now being denizens of the Far Realm. The very environment and state of the world tore away at their souls. They reacted to the material plane the same way a human in our world might react if you were to bombard them with radiation. Their solution after coming all this way and making it back to the material plane was not to simply abandon it and move on however because that drive to exist here still motivated them. They decided they would alter the material plane to serve their needs rather than just leave. They wanted to twist the material plane into something more chaotic that closely resembled the far realm where they were coming from. So today I'm gonna to talk about what these guys can do in battle, some of the other creatures that they associate with, and of course how we can use them in our home fifth edition games. So let's start things off with so first things first, because these guys are aliens from another realm essentially, they do not have the same physiological restrictions as most creatures on the material plane. They don't need to eat, they don't need to sleep, they don't need to drink water, they don't really need to regain energy in any way. They also heavily rely on brains over brawn, they do not find themselves wielding swords very often, and they typically rely on magic or assassination techniques. So amid their ranks you're going to find a lot of rogues and sorcerers. They can cast a bunch of spells innately such as Color Spray, Enlarge Reduce, Feather Fall, and Disguise Self. Most of their spells primarily focus around espionage and disabling their opponents rather than outright killing them. And the reason for this is because of how the Kaordi reproduce. In order for Kaordi to make more Kaordi, they rely solely on a trait called Vile Transformation. If they manage to capture a humanoid creature and they can remain latched onto them with their jaws for 8 hours, that creature is forced to make a save. If the creature fails their constitution save, they are then transformed into a Kaordi. If they do manage to succeed on the save, however, they are not transformed this time, but the Kaordi can try to make them transform again over another 8 hour period, and the save DC is increased by 1. And this is why the Kaordi prefer to focus on disabling opponents rather than outright killing them, because any surviving humanoid creatures that are around after a battle, they can simply take back to their lair and transform them into more troops. Now as I already mentioned briefly, the material plane is toxic to a Kaordi. So how do they manage to survive here given their chaotic forms? Well the answer to that question is fairly simple. A Kaordi can produce a large amount of this resin-like substance every day, and the Kaordi have gotten quite good at fashioning that resin into all 
all different kinds of equipment. The most important of which is the resin skin suit. These creatures are essentially able to make suits of armor out of the resin that their bodies naturally produce and use that armor to protect them from the material plane, kind of like a hazmat suit. So they're free to go wherever they want as long as they are wearing one of these suits whenever they go there. Of course, this comes with the added danger that if their suit is damaged beyond repair while they're away from home, they're not gonna be able to make it back home. But that is the risk they take when invading the material plane, and to them, it's worth it. And as far as straight up attacks go, they of course have a bite attack where they can latch their jaws onto an opponent. This also has a chance to cause the poison condition, which is never a bad thing in a battle. And they also have resin daggers, which again, are more dexterity based weaponry because as I briefly mentioned as well, they do not rely so much on strength as they do on their magical skills and dexterity. But again, if they can help it, they do not want to resort to physical combat if at all possible. But if you wanted to equip these creatures with more of an arsenal, you could give them really any type of weapon you want from the DMG, just describe it as being made out of resin rather than steel or whatever it would normally be made from. The only stipulation here you need to keep in mind is that whenever a Kaori makes a weapon out of resin because of how thin and sharp it is, it rolls four times as many dice on a critical hit and not just two. So they make excellent assassination weapons. And once your players find out about that, they might want to get their hands on some of these weapons too, but I'm getting into plot hooks now, we're not there yet, so hang on. So now I'm sure you're probably wondering what happens to non-humanoid creatures when they're transformed by a Kaori. And this is where the Kaori get some of their most menacing tools in their arsenal. The books give us two separate examples of chaotic monstrosities that are created when the vile transformation ability is used on an animal of some kind. First thing we have is the Sky Bleeder. These things are huge tendrilled monstrosities that soar the skies and rain down acid on their opponents. It has a fly speed of 80 as well, which is ridiculously fast, and they're constantly veiled by an aura of mist. So unless you really are up close and personal, it's hard to tell what you're actually looking at. It just looks like a faintly red cloud from a distance. Sky bleeders are exceptionally cruel and they revel in destroying their enemies, whether it's for sport or for necessity. And as long as the Kaori are able to keep them happy and slake their constant appetite for destruction, they are happy to serve those Kaori as mounts. And it's not uncommon for a Kaori invasion to be preceded by a few of these guys going in ahead of time and wearing down the defenses of their opponents, by literally raining acid on them sometimes for days at a time. And of course these guys are able to cast a few powerful spells as well, such as Cloud Kill, Control Weather, and Call Lightning, all things you'd expect from a disgusting tendril cloud monster. Sky Bleeders definitely pose a significant threat, so you can choose to include them or not include them depending on what level your game is at, but they make great assets for any chaotic hive. Secondly, we have the Rukineer. These creatures are large corruptions of what was probably at one point some sort of scorpion or a scorpion and some other kind of animal combined. These things are intelligent and capable of terrible levels of destruction. In fact, it's said that the original Rukineer slaughtered the Kaori who originally created them, and they're feared just as much as some of the Kaori's enemies. But the Kaori are smart about how they deploy them. They use them more as a bomb than anything else. If they need to soften up a target such as a stronghold or some other kind of encampment, they will simply set one of these things loose. Of course, they expect the Rukineer to die, and it most likely will, However, they just want it to cause as much damage as possible so that the real invasion force can then come in behind it and clean up what's left. It's actually quite smart. And the Rukineer itself is no pushover. They can deafen their enemies, stun their enemies, and cause crazy amounts of damage just with their vocalization. They can do this roar attack that causes immense thunder damage to structures, weapons, and creatures all around them. They're also very hard to kill. They don't have a ridiculously high armor class, but they have a very, very, very good constitution score, which means they have a ton of hit points. Plus, as an added effect, their armor plates they do have are constantly shifting and moving all over their body, so that whenever a melee attack is made against one of these creatures, there's a chance it will be able to catch the weapon between two of its armor plates and simply snap it in half. Honestly, I feel like I could make a whole separate video about both of these creatures, but hopefully that gives you a good overview of what their role in the Kaori army is and what they can actually do. But if you're curious and you want to know more and you would like to actually use one of these creatures in your game, I have included stat blocks for both of these creatures along with the Kaori in the description below. So now that we have a pretty good grip on what these guys can actually do in battle, let's take a look at some. So as I mentioned previously, the Kaori have this uncanny ability to produce resin that they can craft into armor, weapons, whatever it is. 
But there's also another function that this resin serves, which is very, very important. They can use their chaotic resin to build structures, which are referred to as cysts. Now, a chaotic cyst is essentially an area that the chaotic can live in outside of their armor shells. Oftentimes, this will be some kind of abandoned ruin, such as an old wizard's tower or an ancient forgotten village, whatever the case is, they simply coat the walls with this resin and they're able to use this as kind of a makeshift habitat. Of course, if nothing is available, they will simply build a smaller cyst from scratch, but of course, as more Kaori are created and spawned, they begin to propagate themselves, their fortress will expand and expand and expand until it gets to a point where it's so large that they can't fit any more Kaori in that area, nor any more structures, where the cyst will simply split and half the Kaori will move on and find a new place to propagate themselves. And this is their whole game plan for how they want to take over the material plane, by just slowly propagating themselves until there's enough of them where they can split and move on, and just grow and grow and grow. The Kaori are literally, in a way, a cancer that seeks to overcome the material plane. And that is a whole plot hook in and of itself. It would be relatively easy to simply make the Kaori the big bad of a campaign and have it so that they are in fact trying to take over the material world and the players are just going around stomping out these chaotic cysts wherever they come up. You could also do this on a much smaller scale where maybe the party is encountering the first wave of Kaori that have come over from the Far Realm, so it's not like a whole global threat at this point, there's just a cyst that pops up and no one really knows what it is. But on the flip side of that, like I said, you could have it be a whole battle for survival where it's just all these kingdoms from the material plane fighting against the Kaori because if the Kaori win, everyone loses. So they have to overcome their old feuds and put aside their differences to come together to save the world. Another thing I'd like to just mention here too is the two examples of modified chaotic creatures that the books give us, the Skybleeder and the Rukaneer, are really cool, but you could totally come up with your own creatures if you wanted to. This is a great example to just think, well, what would a chaotic version of maybe a deer look like or a chaotic version of some kind of hunting dog? Like literally anything you can come up with, you could just make up your own creatures and then use those creatures to fill in whatever CR slots you need them in. You want some CR two or three support animals, Maybe they've got some small woodland creatures that they've mutated into these horrible monstrosities. Or maybe you need something really strong and powerful so there's a chaotic version of like a T-Rex or some other crazy animal. I mean, hell, maybe the Kaori are traveling around on top of a moving cyst which is in fact a corrupted Tarrasque or something. Who knows? The possibilities are literally endless. You could just flip through the monster manual and say, huh, what would this look like if it was a chaotic abomination? Another way you could use these creatures too is not so much as an invasion force but kind of an emissary for a god from the Far Realm. So maybe in your game you've got some cultists that are trying to summon Cthulhu or your other favorite Far Realm denizen, and the Kaori are sent through this rift that the cultists open up as kind of emissaries to their god. I mean, maybe the cult is even being led by a powerful Kaori wizard. Because that's the other thing here too, is these creatures at the base level are fine, but it's intended that you'll add on to them. They're kind of like orcs, you have just all your basic orcs, which is great for a low level game, but if you wanted to make, say, an orc war boss, I mean, there is the orc chieftain in the book, but like a real powerful, like, CR8 creature, you would give it fighter levels or barbarian levels or something. So the implication here with the Kaori is if you wanted to, say, have like a high chaotic priest or some kind of wizard, you would just give them levels of sorcerer and give them extra spells and make them more powerful. They're kind of a blank template that you can add anything onto that you want, and you don't even have to really justify much of it because it's just far realm weirdness, which is kind of great. If you happen to be playing a game as well that takes place on the outer planes and the party is kind of hopping from plane to plane and going all over the place, you could simply use Kaori as a denizen of the Far Realm. If the party at one point ends up in one of the outer planes, the Kaori are probably one of the most relatable Far Realm creatures that you could have since they are vaguely humanoid in shape unlike pretty much everything else that lives there. I mean, hell, they're not super overpowered based on their initial stats and stuff, so you could easily use these as player characters too if you wanted to play like a Kaori campaign, that could be kind of fun. Maybe you're a group of Kaotic adventurers that are lost somewhere on the material plane or some other plane, they're trying to find their way back home. Or you could forgo all of the kind of evil lore and that kind of stuff behind the Kaori and simply have a group of Kaori in your game that the players stumble upon that are just trying to get back to where they came from, the Far Realm which is often associated with evil creatures and all this madness and everything, but maybe the Kaori in your world don't subscribe to that and they are simply trying to get home. I mean, there's really no limit to what you can do with these creatures, they just make interesting denizens of an outer plane. 
And at the end of the day, at their very worst, they are just good general bad guys whenever you have an Elder God at play. So that is all I've got for these creatures today. Hopefully you enjoyed that and hopefully you found this video helpful. I do just want to say thank you to Buffalo Guy 1991 over on the Discord server for the suggestion of the Kaordi, which was today's video. And if you are not a member of our Discord community already, you can find links to that and Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, all that good stuff in the description below, as well as my Patreon if you are able to support me in that way. That's fantastic. Anyways, I do just want to say thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it, and I will see you guys in the next video. Till then.